Director of My Little Pony, Mr. Jason Thiessen. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hey, Pony. Hi, Jason. How's it going? Pretty good. Enjoying the con? Yeah. Better be. It seems to be going pretty well. Can you tell? <laughs> As long as everyone's having a good time. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's important. As long as everyone's having fun. Yeah. Fun. 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 Just to let everyone in the audience know, the way we're going to do this today is, my name is Dubra, I'll be moderating. We're going to be going back and forth some questions, kind of storytelling. And once I run out of material, we are going to open up to fan Q&A. So I know you guys got questions, right? Seriously, yeah. Alright, that's what I want to hear. <laughs> right, so, so what do you want to know? Okay. So, the first thing, to start off extremely, extremely basic, how did you get into directing the show? Uh, directing the show, um, it, it's uh, just sort of ha happened in a way. Uh, <laughs> I was working for DHX, I was doing uh, animating on Martha Speeds. I had, I had directed on shows before um, with uh, Puka, two seasons of Puka, um, for Disney and, and Jetix UK. And uh, so that was that, and that show was my first time ever directing. Um, I had kind of moved up to ranks in DHX, and I had so much fun directing Puka, and, and um, I really kind of started to realize, like, you know, I, I think I, I think I'd like to be a director <laughs> while I was doing the job. Um, no, I, I, hello. Oh, that, that, sorry, that was me. Um, yeah, so, uh, and that I didn't really have um, much going on at the time, uh, and uh, then this came along. I kind of heard some rumors that there might be a new My Little Pony show coming to the studio, and I was like, well, what? My Little Pony? You know, like, I, did, I didn't know anything about how it was being kind of uh, developed or anything. Uh, so when they came and, and asked me, like, hey, you did a good job with Puka, maybe you want to do this? And I was like, well, show it to me first. <laughs> but then when I saw it, and I saw that Lauren Faust's name was attached to it, and that she had done all this work and all this development, and then I saw, you know, the characters and the world and everything, I was like, oh, oh, I think I can do this. It, it was an instant uh, kind of interest. So um, I, uh, I agreed to take the job, and then, you know, just went from there. And, uh, you know, we did a... The, at the time, the studio um, was sort of, they were testing like how the, the look of the show will, will be because there wasn't any animation done at that point, it was just development materials. So um, they kind of commissioned uh, a little short, which I don't think ever has been shown publicly. Are we going to find that then? Yeah, you tr try to find it, I don't think you can. Um, but anyway, it's like a little one minute short that kind of demonstrated how we would animate and, and how the show would look like finished. Um, and it kind of convinced Hasbro to go with us and, and all that stuff. And convinced Lauren that we can do it and everything. And I got to meet her and we worked together on it. And, uh, and it just, it was, it was great. It turned out really well. And, um, and at the time I thought the show was going to be still quite, you know, cutesy and, and fun and, and simple. So, uh, once we got the first script of the pilot, and I was reading through it, I was going, wait a second, this is, this is not a cutesy, simple show, this is epic, like, this is a, this is like a movie, you know, like, and so I kind of changed my mind about how the show will look and feel, and, um, and then with Lauren's help and stuff, we, we kind of shaped it and molded it into what, you know, we see today. So what was it like, like developing the uh, animation in Flash and the style of it? Because when you look at other cartoons, there's nothing else out there that looks like it aesthetically or how it moves or anything. Right. Even like the walk styles, everything else uses like human characters, two legs. What was it like just going into four legs, making the whole aesthetics for the show? Every animator will tell you that you know four-legged walk cycles are not easy. And this was going to be an entire TV series about four-legged walk cycles and, and everything without fingers, which is a hard thing too because they they move and act like humans. And uh, how do we uh, how do we um, you know do simple things like picking things up or you know? Do they pick it up? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, so. 
we had to, we had a lot of challenges that way, and Lauren really wanted to keep the show, uh, keep the characters horses, yeah. and and not like you know have objects just magically stick to their hoofs and things like that, um, which we have gotten away with here and there, but we try to really put a logic behind it why things are, are working a certain way. Um, so anyway, when we were developing the animation, um, the really smart thing, this, this came from Lauren, is because uh, she knew it was going to be Flash, so she, she tried to design the characters to, to work with Flash. Because at first um, there was a question about how much their hair was going to move, how detailed their hair would be, because back then it was all about hair play, like we got to make this a hair based show in a way. <laughs> Um, but uh, but she was really smart. She was like, we'll, we'll make the design really simple, and um, that will give us we we can get away with with more, and it'll still feel full, but without being super detailed. It's got more of a graphic look to it, and then we can um, animate it simpler. So, and on top of that, she had designed all of the characters to have the the same exact body size and shape and and type. The only thing different was their personalities, which was a great, and then, you know, the color of their, of their fur and their hair and everything, that was what dis determined them. But their bodies were all the same. So, and so us as animators and Flash guys, we were like, that's perfect, because <laughs> we can utilize those assets. You know, we make one really good build of the pony, and then it's just a matter of swapping out colors and symbols and, and changing the uh, the hair color and stuff and and style. So uh, that really made it easier for us, and it was it gave us more freedom to, to do more wacky stuff because we could we could start doing more uh, detailed like preliminary art. Like we would do a run cycle with one pony from all angles. And that could be applied to every other pony. It's just a matter of changing the color. So um, that really helped um, to, to make the show more um, doable in Flash. Um, and from there, we just elaborate, elaborate, elaborate until we got like a huge uh, asset library of, of all kinds of stuff that we can reuse. And I'm sure you guys have picked up on it here and there where there's an expression or a piece of animation that you see used again and again and uh, you know we try to add new stuff we try to make new stuff all the time but you know TV show constraints what they are it's it's a it's a great thing to be able to reuse and repurpose items just it's always done everywhere <laughs> so um, it gives us more uh, more of a chance to elaborate storytelling and character and other things so we're not you know breaking our backs trying to do a, a, a brand new thing every scene I can't imagine that's easier, but I like to think that when you get the scripts, a lot of the aesthetics like like Weathermakers and Cloudsdale, they're not really described. Are they described in detail, or do you have to go a lot into how to design it aesthetically and how to put that into the show? Uh, sorry, what was that again? Like the weather, or what just uh, like in Cloudsdale, how they have like the whole rainbow factory, how they set that up. Do they oh. give you detailed descriptions of what exactly is going to be where, or do you just pretty much have to wing it? Oh, um, yeah, that was. That was pretty much figured out at the episode stage. So when we got the episode that they were going to go to Cloudsdale, that's when you know they wrote kind of, kind of the detail of how it works, and then we had to work it out as kind of on the fly a little bit because um, it wasn't 100% worked out ahead of time. Um, so and which, which was good because it gave us flexibility with the storytelling because that was what's really important is how to tell the story correctly. So if the details have to change and, and adjust to, to allow for that, then that's fine. And if it's flexible, then that, that gives us a, a chance to uh, adjust things. Because there's always stuff that gets cut out and moved around, and you know, we find that it, it's a better build if we move uh, this section before that section, and, um, and we're able to do that, then that's great. So, besides just the four legged creatures, there are a few like Stephen Bag and the Sea Serpent, uh, King Sombra, that really don't have four legs. What is it like for those unique characters designing those, making them move in the Flash animator? Yeah, um, Stephen Magnet, which is a name you guys came up with, <laughs> he, did, he was just the sea serpent. 
Um, but yeah, he's a, a snake-like creature, so it was a bit of a challenge because Flash, if anyone who knows how Flash works, it, it's it's not exactly the most uh, easy program to you to you either do it classically or you move things around it in pieces. So um, we had to come up with clever ways to to make it still feel kind of classical-like and and, um, and feel like he's moving um, fluidly and, and stuff. So. We have these techniques where you know we take a, a flash asset, we bring it into Illustrator, and then we can turn it into an Illustrator brush and then animate it in Illustrator. Do give give all the positions, and then put it, bring it back into Flash, and then the animators time it out. It's kind of a lengthy process, but the result is is pretty good. Um, and uh, the same thing with the hair and tail cycles. There's a lot of tricks that where we we utilize. Uh, brushes and at Illustrator and then bring them back in the flash and just do the conversions and then uh, marry it all together. And speaking of the hair, like you see throughout season one to the premiere of season three, just like for example Twilight's hair. In the very beginning it was very kind of static, just moved with the character, but in season three when she's singing the failure song, you see it blowing like just separate strands. How hard was it to go from that first episode to that season three premiere, just animating the hair that way? Funny you should ask about that, because the hair from that scene that everyone loves, that was from the original uh, animated uh, bit that we did for Hasbro oh, really? <laughs> to get the show, yeah. Because um, there, uh, there was a scene in which Twilight's hair gets, you know, whipped by, by or Rainbow Dash flies by and her hair goes messy. And uh, because at the time we were like, it's all about hair animation, we gotta make the hair animation good. Um, we built those hair um, models in Illustrator, animated them that way, and I animated that. And um, so we, we had it back then, but we never really had a chance to use it in the show, and it was kind of forgotten for a while. And then there was that scene and it brought up um, for that episode, and then I was like, you know, this would be perfect to go back and grab that animation that I did back in the, the very beginning and put it in here. So it finally got to see the light of day. <laughs> so it's been around for a while. It just uh, just never had a chance to see the light. That's honestly like, amazing to hear because like just watching that without knowing that you think it's just the evolution of the animators and the direction going forward, but that honestly kind of blows my mind. <laughs> So, you know, we, we had to make some concessions for, for time and, and budget reasons, so, yeah, stuff like that didn't, didn't get always to be um, on the production because it was kind of a complicated process. What, what I had done, I had reached for the stars, basically, I was like doing something that, you know, when we put it into production, they were like, yeah, we could do that, but uh, then the show won't be done on time, and, you know, like, they're just... And not everyone was in production was able to uh, kind of understand how I did that, the, the way that I did it. So, um, and it was only good for certain shots, so it was like, okay, maybe it's not worth it. Let's not compromise our time and focus more on the, the more important stuff, like the characters and the, and the storytelling. How hard is it to work within that 22 minute time frame? Because I gotta assume like, some episodes, I'll be honest, they seem some kind of sometimes kind of rushed because I have to imagine the, these are really good stories in each and every episode. To try to cram it down to that 22 minutes has to be extremely difficult. What is your process of trying to fit it all in? It, it can it can be kind of uh, tricky sometimes. Um, what I I mean I came from when I was directing Puka, those were seven minute episodes, and a lot of times the writing was. Uh, good for 11 minutes. So we would end up with like, oh, this is a 10 minute show that we have to cut down to seven minutes. How do we cram it all in? That's uh, basically a third at that point. Yeah, yeah, you're doing that. We would do three seven minute episodes in a, in a, um, oh, sorry. Uh, we would do like, technical difficulties. Yeah, that's okay. Um, yeah, we would, we would have three seven minute episodes in a 22 minute block. Uh, so, but each one had to be a self-contained story. So it got tricky sometimes when we had enough story for 11 minutes and we had to take out four minutes. Um, and so it, it happens on Pony too, where uh, sometimes we get an animatic in and it turns out like, oh, this is like 27 minutes long. <laughs> 
uh, how are we going? We're going to have to cut some stuff down. Um, but I was really happy when we were doing a 22 minute, you know, going from seven minute. I suddenly was like, oh, I have time. I can I can actually tell a story now, <laughs> and uh, we can have atmosphere. We can you, you can have establishing shots, and like you didn't have to just rush into the story all the time. So I kind of appreciated that 22 minute, you know, three act uh, uh, process. And um, but it's still like it, it gets big. So you know, we have all these grand ideas now, and then they get beyond our abilities to produce in 22 minutes. So yeah, sometimes we have to sacrifice certain elements in order to get it in, and um, it, it, it gets tricky, for sure. And that's why some, we have, for the big stories, like the openers and closers of the season, we would do two parts, because it just, it's too big. But doing those two parts, do you think it's more difficult to cram it into 44 minutes? Because there's a lot more story at that point. Yeah, it, it, it's always a challenge. I mean, it, every episode has, uh, like, thankfully we haven't had any episodes really that have come in way short. Um, and then we had to pad it out. Uh, it, it only really happened a couple of times in season one. But ever since then, it's always about getting it down to time because it's too long. Um, but a lot of that is either, you know, uh, the storyboard artists having fun and adding in new stuff or there's like, you know, lots of stuff in the script, or just, you know, timing, like in the Trixie Returns episode, the, the Magic Duel, uh, there's this face-off that happens, and it's kind of like an old Western, and I wanted to have a really long, slow, kind of um, drawn-out duel happening, like a spaghetti Western sort of thing, and uh, we, had, we had it cut that way at first, but it was like 30 minutes long. <laughs> Because there was other scenes in there in that script that that uh, we also had in there that were just lengthening it out. It was a, it was a, it was a, there was a lot more going on, and we found that, that we just can't do all of this. We have to we have to eliminate it. So at that point, it's me and the editor trying to um, take out things that don't affect the greater story, that don't hurt the story. And you might lose some characterization, you might lose a few gags or something, but the important thing is the story arc that you know we're we're trying to achieve. So um, yeah, things things get lost, things get left on the cutting room floor, but that's part of the industry, it's part of the, the process. What has been the hardest thing you've had to cut and leave on that floor that you were like really proud of, wanted to get in there? Um there's been some things, but not too much. Like usually, what we cut out is stuff that's just unnecessary. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, uh, after cutting it, I'm like, oh, actually, that that feels better. You know, like sometimes it can it can kind of get drawn out, and you're like, you know, well, this part's feeling a little flat. You know, why are we feeling flat? Well, we got to take out time. What if we took that out, and then we see it without it? And like, oh, that actually feels better. You know, <laughs> it can actually help. Um, there's only been a couple of times where we've actually lost an entire sequence, like I'm sure you all know, in, in, uh, in Luna Eclipse there was a scene where Rarity makes up Luna into a pretty pink princess, and um, that was all done, and it was, but it was like an extra minute that we just didn't have, you know, I, had, I was like, well, I'm a minute over, w what can I take out, and so <laughs> we went through and I'm like, well, I don't want to lose that, I don't want to lose that, I don't want to and then my editor was like, well, this section is a minute. <laughs> like, well, yeah, can I lose that? Well, maybe. And it, so we, we tried that, and it actually felt fine without it. So that was like, well, there's our minute. Um, so somewhere out there, there's a, there's a clip of that. It wasn't animated. It was, it was storyboarded. Um, so there's, a, there's probably a version on the server somewhere that you can't hack into. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> I'm not challenging you. Please do not do that. Seriously, don't do it. Don't lose it. That will not end well for anybody, especially me. Because I'm the one who said it. <laughs> me too. So, ju not just counting My Little Pony, going to Puka and every other show you've worked on, what has been your biggest challenge so far? What has really pushed you the hardest? Um, well, I mean, this show is always challenging me. But in a good way, you know, because it pushes me to try new things and, and uh, 
you know, go beyond my comfort zone. Um, and it, it's a learning process. It's always a learning. I'm always learning new things. So uh, I love that about this show. Um, Apuka season one was probably my biggest challenge because that was my first time directing. I had been an animator forever and, uh, and did little bits of storyboards here and there. Um, and then uh, I, when Puka came to buy the studio, I, w I got really excited about it. I'm like, this is a good show. I want to do this show really badly. And uh, that's when I was like, okay, I want to direct this. I got I to gotta direct, you know. Um, but then when I got into it, it was just a, something I had never done before. It was like a whole new world <laughs> had suddenly opened up and I'm like, oh, there's a lot more to this than I ever realized. And uh, I was like literally running from, from department to department because I was running out of time constantly. Like I'd have 10 minutes to do this, 10 minutes to do that, and I'd be, have to make decisions on the fly. And like then I'd see the final result, like, ah, that's not good enough, but there's no one to do it. Okay, I'll go do it. And I'd be running to my desk and like, animate the revision myself and then go back to the editor and say okay bring this in put that here you know it was very uh, on the fly and it's just really quite stressful um, but uh, that really kind of made me learn a lot of things and learned where to let go and, and you know how to think about big picture and and all that stuff so it was it was hard work but it was a great learning experience for sure it was like boot camp <laughs> To anyone who's looking to getting into anime, we'll start with animation and we'll be directing. What would you recommend them to start doing to get into animation? Oh, um, well, I mean, I got into animation when uh, the thing you'd say is draw, 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 every day draw, you know, and, and watch cartoons and watch animation, watch Disney films, uh, you know, try to mimic what they're doing, learn how they're doing it, take little courses and stuff, but nowadays uh, with the internet and with, uh, you know, digital an animation, um, there's a lot you can learn on your own. You, you don't even, like, like going to school is, is great. You should go, you know, find a good school to, to, to learn animation, but there's so much resources out there. You can do it on your own time. You can do it and, and learn and you can, you can join Animation Mentor. Um, there's websites and all kinds of stuff where you, it's really up to you um, to get your skills to a level where you can get hired. And in the animation field, if you went to school or not, um, I don't really, really think matters as much. It's just like, how good is your portfolio? Can you do the job? And, uh, you know, can you keep up with the schedule and, the, and, the, and, the, and everything like that? So it's really about, and this kind of comes from how I got into it, it's just your own desire. Do you really want to do this? Because seriously, do you really want to do this? <laughs> you have to really want to do it. it. It's not an easy industry to work in. Um, it, you really have to have a, a drive and a desire. And that was one of the things my teachers told me when I was in film school is, um, like, I think it was day one when we came in and, and they basically the first thing the teacher's saying is like, do not get into animation. Whatever you do, do not get a job. Do not go into this industry. <laughs> and we're like, what? These are these are the people teaching us. Like, and uh, it was kind of like a way of weeding out the, you know, the people who didn't really care that much. Because like, it, that didn't deter me. That was just like, no, damn it, I'm gonna do this. You can't tell me not to. You know. So uh, and uh, and the people who were who felt that way actually ended up working in the industry the most. And then directing My Little Pony. Yeah, perhaps. And <laughs> um, so it's really about your determination. Do you really want to do it? And how? what are you willing to do to make it happen? Um, like I, I would walk from studio to studio with my portfolio in hand and just rap on their door and be like, do you have any work? Here's my portfolio. Give me a call. Like it was just a lot of ground, you know, ground level footwork, walking around and, and meeting people, and that's how I got my first job. It was just that determination. How important is location in that? Because I know you're based out of Vancouver, and I know it's really big down in Vancouver, but I've come from Boston where there's almost nothing. Like, how right. important is getting there, going physically to locations and going to studios like that? Yeah, I mean, that I was lucky enough to to be living already in Vancouver where there is a lot of animation work. Um, so I didn't have to relocate or anything, but um, I mean, LA is big for animation and I'm sure New York has lots of animation and there's little 
little pockets throughout North America, but yeah, the big places would would be like LA and, and maybe San Fran and, and Vancouver, New York, and uh, a few other little places, Toronto maybe. Um, so yeah, being in the location helps, but these days again with technology, uh, a lot of people, like I've done work remotely for people in Texas that just, I need you to do some animation for me. Just like how you guys all communicate with each other and, and work together over the, the internet, they do that in the industry too. We have people working <coughs> from home in, in different cities, um, and uh, just you know, thankfully we can we can send files and, and everything like that. So uh, you can you can work from just about anywhere, really. Awesome. It's just about getting the job. Once you've got the job, that's you're safe. Yeah, well, <laughs> as long as you do the work at least. Yeah, and you do the work, and you're trustworthy because sometimes uh, people can say one thing and do another, and then we realize, oh, well, not gonna hire that guy again because <laughs> he totally screwed us. <laughs> um, so don't do that. Uh, yeah, getting a reputation, being reliable, all those things, taking direction, you know, doing revisions, and and uh, not complaining about it. <laughs> Um, and able and being able to uh, are, understand what we're looking for and then meet the meet the demand kind of thing, um, you know, just like any job, really. So my final question before we open it up to the fans is: out of everything you've done from Puka to My Little Pony, anything you can't tell us about, <laughs> what are you absolutely most proud of? If you had to show what would be essentially your life's work, what you've achieved at this point, what would it be? Well, I, I'd have to say My Little Pony, because uh, I've been in the business for, for like 15, 16 years now, and I've worked on lots of different things, and they were all kind of forgotten. And, uh, you know, I just didn't, at the time I didn't care, because I'm just like, I'm just happy that I have a job animating, that was like, that was my dream at the time. And I was already like pretty happy with that, because um, it was like, I get to go to work and, and make silly pictures dance all day. <laughs> How, who, who wouldn't want to do that? It was, a, it was kind of like the dream job. So, I mean, other than, you know, the fact that it is hard work and not always, uh, you know, that rewarding with money and stuff like that. I've done some things that, that I uh, worked very hard on and didn't get any money and nobody really cared about it. So, you got to really, that's why I say you got to really do it for you. You have to really want to do it because there's going to be times where you you do work and uh, you know you're you're not really paid for the hours you put into it. There was one job that I did where I worked for three weeks straight trying to animate this classical, really detailed like Native American with wrinkly face. He was an old guy with lots of braids and wrinkly face and like medallions and tassels and it was a really complicated character. I spent three weeks animating it. And I got three hundred dollars for it, and uh, and it was put on TV for one little special that never really saw the light of day. Nobody really saw it, so it was like all that was for me, you know. <laughs> and uh, but that was like early on, and like those are the sacrifices you make in order to to get the the next job. You know, it's always about the next job. So my I, all the things that I've done up to this point was you know, leading up to My Little Pony. So what's My Little Pony leading to? So right now, this is, this is the best thing I've ever done. And, but what's maybe the next show that comes along might be even better, who knows? Hopefully it's That's always job, up, but <laughs> um, My Little Pony, I'm sure, will, will be going on for quite a while. So I'm not, oh, yeah, uh, we're not worried about that right? anytime soon. <laughs> um, all right, in that case, we're going to open up to a fan Q&A. Just let me get around the table here. No, it's difficult. <laughs> Could I just uh, ask you one question? Yeah, sure. I'm fascinated, okay? <laughs> um, <laughs> two things, yeah, sure. Yeah. Big fan here. Um, let's see, you say, you know, the main thing is getting the work, you know? Yeah. What's the main driver? I mean, is it... Uh, toy companies that say I want to move this product so I need somebody to make a series or is it I've, somebody inherits money I'd like to see this be made and they hire you I mean like like the work that comes in what drives the work that comes in yeah what drives the work I mean, um, it's got to start and you're saying how you started in the business but now that you're sustained in the business you know the phone rings what happens <laughs> yeah. uh, that's an interesting question um, I mean the 
like Hasbro's, Hasbro's motivation for My Little Pony is the hub. They, they had the network coming along, they knew they were gonna need show content, and they had all these properties, um, and, uh, but they weren't doing anything with them at the time. So of course they're like, well, what do we have that we could market right now? My Little Pony, Transformers, G.I. Joe, all these like big names from the past. So it was up to them to, you know, create new content. So um, that was pretty much their motivation. But you know, and then other motivations are just like Puka was on uh, was on JetX UK, which was another fledgling network at the time that got bought by Disney. Um, and they needed content as well. Right, so they own the intellectual rights. Yeah. And it was just, hey, we already have this, let's we do have something this. with it. Yeah, let's, because, you know, put it on TV, you can market it, you can get merchandising deals, licensing. Okay. Uh, Great. I don't know, like, I don't know much about the network business, but uh, I would imagine that, you know, it's all about getting eyes on screen and getting advertisers to. To I, would say, I would say it worked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it worked it out worked. really well. Um, you so, must be really good at this. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like, yeah, like there were some projects that I've done that were smaller and like just for like a music video for a band or um, you know a little little web web app or something like that. So it's really just about you know who who, who needs what for what and sure, sure. and uh, what keeps me going is well I'm sorry it's a job <laughs> I'm sorry everybody out there that does art understands that too you yeah know, you just never know what, where it's gonna come from I'm That's gonna right. yield to anybody out there who has a question please come on up and use the microphone so everybody can hear your question That's what you want Hello, Jason. Hi. Hi. My name is Jennifer. I'm here Hi. at the Anime Jam session. Hi. And I actually had done some work as a freelance artist in, in my past, right after I got out of college. And um, I did want to ask you some questions about the industry. You, right now, of course, you're working on My Little Pony. And do you work as an independent contractor? Are you employed by the hub? Are you, like, how does that work? Are you on contract, contract to contract, work for hire? Uh, I work on contract with DHX Media, so they, they hire me and um, I'm basically a permanent fixture there, <laughs> even though it's a contract based thing. Uh, so like I'm in I'm in house, I work for them, and I and I uh, you know just keep doing the show as long as they have show to give me. <laughs> and you brought up a really good point about breaking into the industry and the idea that the money isn't always fantastic, right. and the fact that you wind up doing things just for yourself. I have uh, experienced that in the past as just getting small freelance static, just art, I'm not an animator, just did art uh, contracts. What do you think an artist can best do? Sometimes I feel that artists really get almost abused or put over because the corporate types think that the creative types are willing to do things for themselves. Yeah. And I will tell you, I've been recently trying to break back into the freelance as a third income. I've already got two jobs. <laughs> After like seven years of dormancy, I turned down an opportunity because the person was, um, she has her own business. And when I, she wanted me to, to design something for a PowerPoint presentation, and I was asking her, how is it going to, going to be used? I started talking about my contract. Do you, uh, do you want work for hire because that's going to change the price? Do you want to, uh, if you're publishing, you want to pay royalty? And she's like, I don't even want to deal. Why are you asking me about a contract? Can't you just draw this for me? And I said, I honey, when you take your, your little training thing and you go to businesses, would you do that corporate training that you apparently make a better living than I do off of because you right. bought a house, I'm getting bought out of my apartment next month. So would you do that without them signing a contract? Right. And then she just looked at me. I said, I'm not really interested in this. Uh, come back to me if you're looking to rebrand and you're looking to sign this. So what would you suggest that an artist would do to try and strengthen their leverage when negotiating or obtaining it's, work? It's, it's tough because uh, it's a good thing to bring up because it happens to a lot of illustrators and a lot of artists. Um, and uh, I think uh, we all kind of have to band together and, and realize that we're worth something. Because if you if you want to build a house and you con you con contact a contractor and you say I want to build this house but can you just build half of it and then I'll pay you once I like it you know it's not going to do that and if you want to make re revisions to the house while you're being while you're, while you're building it he you know he, oh can we add this can we add that he'll say sure here's how much it will cost and here's how much time it will add and uh, 
artists get asked those kinds of questions all the time, but we're not we're not compensated for those things. They're just like, just draw it. Can't you just fix this? It's like, well, that takes time and energy and everything. So, um, and, the, and the problem is that a lot of artists who are asked those things, uh, if they say, no, I'm not going to do it. You have to pay me. They'll, a lot of, uh, you know, these of these clients might just go, okay, well, there's another artist over here who's willing to do it for less because he's got enthusiasm or whatever, and they don't know what they're worth. So it's kind of up to all artists to to kind of they owe it to themselves and to the other artists to uh, remember how much they're worth and to uh, not do work for free, essentially. So basically, don't do anything for free that uh, you're not willing to give away for free. <laughs> Reach on. I, much more kind of note. I had another thing that didn't work out. I had done some sketches and she realized she didn't want to go with it because I had a contract. She said, I will pay you for time already put into this project. So once you have that contract and it states that, you know, you will get people willing to do it. And that was, you know, one of the more positive things that's come out of trying to get back right. into it, but have a contract. Yeah. Look it up online. Just, just fight for yourself and then know that by fighting for yourself, you're actually fighting for all the other artists out there. Thank you. Thank you for your time again, very, very Hi, I'm Dana, and Hi. I'm also with Anime Jam Session, and that was my friend Jen. Um, I was actually going to ask, how long have you been drawing? Like, have you been started from like, little toddler? Uh, yeah, I, I, I remember uh, drawing and loving drawing when I was in kindergarten. Uh, Me too. I mean, every kid draws when they're that young. It's it's fine. That's the kid thing. But as I got older, I started to draw more, and uh, I didn't think of it as a career. I just liked doing it. Um, and I would even like, like I would read comic books and things, and and just like uh, want to draw. Like, you know, I, it was Garfield. But Aww. anyway, <laughs> I was That's young, so and uh, I liked to trace. I would trace the. The characters, and I would like you now. I'd be I mean, learning how to to draw them, and that actually is a good way to learn how to draw. I found out later that um, by tracing, you kind of get into the the feeling of how that artist works, and then you can use that to to kind of branch off and, and get better on your own. And that's how I started. Um, I would I would trace Looney Tunes. I would trace Ooh. Snoopy and and all that stuff. Yeah, because they have so many different types of styles of the way they draw yeah. their animation. Because I I can do um, still art, but I can't draw like um, moving animation. I can't it's a different do that. skill. Yeah. It is. It's such a different skill. And I've noticed when I've done still art, when I've done different cartoon characters, when I seen them on like a computer screen or something and I've traced them. There's so many different types of styles to do it. So yeah. it's a good way to practice when you have different characters to draw. Yeah, and, and uh, it takes time to find your own style. I mean, it's oh, something yeah. you have to work on. Like, you know, even I'm like, I don't even know what my personal style is. I was I can't actually going to ask you that. Yeah. What is your style? <laughs> um, I, I like to draw silly, wacky, you know, more cartoony. Um, I'm not very good with realistic and, and um, more stylized, more graphic, more uh, Looney Tunes kind of style. Um, that's, what, that's what motivated me when I was young. So that, that sort of stuck with me. That's um, awesome. Yeah. And uh, I, wanna, I, wasn't, I was going to say something, but now I forgot. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, just, just, uh, I used to draw when I was just really young. And I, and I, I didn't think about it as a career until I became a teenager and I was in high school and uh, I had a friend who was really into it as well. We kind of clicked on um, on animation together and that's what kind of got me, he was interested in it as like, you know, something you could do for a living more. And um, I realized like, oh yeah, people make money doing this. This is, this is someone's job. So I started to look into animation and then that's when I realized like, oh, there's work in Vancouver and I could, you know, actually get into this business and stuff. So I got really interested in the animation industry when I was about 15, I'd say. Wow. Um, and then, uh, you know, I was animating my own little things and little bits of stop motion. Um, and I just got really interested. I, got, I bought books. I looked at everything I could find. There was no internet. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I kind of researched it on my own. So by the time I got into a school, 
I already knew quite a bit of what you had all what I needed. Yeah. Knowledge. So uh, it was a bit easier for me to get through school. And there was some people there who were just taking the course to because they were curious about animation. They didn't know much about it, and um, they they kind of realized you know it wasn't really for them at that point. But I was already it's committed to it by the time <laughs> I got in. <laughs> Thank you enough for answering my questions. Anybody yeah, no else want to go? Oh, I don't know who to pick. Uh, who, do you want to pick somebody, Jason? Uh, <laughs> you. Yeah. Should I come on? Yeah, come sure. Here, please. Yeah. I'm curious about the uh, writing process for My Little Pony. Uh, does a writer come up with an idea for an episode and then he or she writes it, or does the idea come up in the room and a writer is assigned to it? Um, well, we, at the beginning of a season, um, the, the writers and, and the head writer will all get together, and uh, I've been a part of a couple of these meetings where uh, we do like a couple of days of uh, just sitting there and thinking about what are we going to do for the next season, what's our game plan. And we'll, we'll just fire out ideas at each other, just little nuggets of something like the Too Many Pinkie Pies was like, oh, how about somehow Pinkie Pie clones herself and there's like just a, a rampaging, you know, horde of Pinkie Pies going around. Oh, and, uh, you know, that, that's just like a joke that we're laughing about in the room. And then someone's writing it down, I'm like, okay, yeah, let's, let's make that an episode somehow. Let's see if we can do it. And we come up with tons of stuff on the fly not all of them end up being episodes, but a few of them do. Um, and uh, so it, it happens that um, it, a lot of the season is kind of worked out at, at those meetings. But then as we go through the season, things change, different um, needs come up from Hasbro, and other writers might pitch a, a show that they're working on, or an idea, or whatever. Um, so it's... Uh, it, it kind of all mostly happens at first in, in that meeting, but then beyond that, it just kind of comes up as it comes up. Thank you. All right, we got time for a few more. Um, Red Beret in the back. Hey. Um, Hi. I actually just had a uh, kind of a technical question about sure. Spectre Service. Um, that was, I think, the first episode that had 3D animation with the Timberwolves. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and I was, I was just curious, as I've used Flash a few times, and as far as I'm aware, there was no native 3D suite in that program. So I was wondering what you did to get those characters, like model them, uh, bring them, and how you integrated that into your workflow with Flash. Um, actually, that wasn't the first time. It was, uh, it was the um, uh, Wonderbolt Academy, the, the Dizitron was in 3D. Um, but though, those episodes were, um, the, the, layout, the layout supervisor for those episodes, John Cantley, he, he does 3D modeling himself. And when we didn't have a plan to do it in 3D, um, but uh, when we got to that, he was looking at it and he was like, yeah, we could build this in Flash and it would look a certain way. But he was thinking like, you know, I could do this really easily in Maya if I just, uh, so he just kind of went ahead and did it. And he, he, looking at all the shots we had of the Timberwolves, he was like, let's, let's try this in 3D. And he asked us if, we, if he would be okay if we could do it. And we were like, yeah, I'd, I'd like to see that. You know, what does it look like in 3D? So he went ahead and did it. And, um, and uh, because of the shots that we were trying to achieve, uh, it just would have been next to impossible to do it with Flash, because all the, the, the sticks and the, the wood that made up the, the design. So, we went with that because I thought yeah, it looked it looked pretty good. So um, you know, it was a it was a bit of an experiment, um, and uh, I don't know how, how often we'll get to do that, but it came out of basically that. Yeah. Have we got time for one more question? Yeah, you've been waiting for a while. I know you have. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you did take up the time. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was, I, I, I was wondering if you could tell us a, a little more about some, uh, some of your other f uh, favorite moments to create, but, 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 but with more of the characters that don't get as much love, like, like the Cutie Mark Crusaders and Spike, so like pheromones for those characters? 
Oh, so my favorite moments for the, the kind yeah, of the secondary the, characters? Yeah, your favorite moments to like, to, to like create and, and see come to life. Um, that's interesting. Uh, like, I, I, I liked Spike. Um, I, I think I liked it when he uh, became a giant dragon. That, <laughs> that episode was, was fun. Uh, it was a it was a new kind of canon for dragons. Like it was something that we could kind of discover and learn about how dragons work a little bit. And is this unique to just Spike, or is it all of them? Like you know, maybe there's more to explore with that. And will it could it ever happen again? I don't know. But it, it was a a neat uh, a neat thing that um, that that we got to do. And I think I like that one probably. Okay. Um, and also the the Aloysius episode, uh, I kind of like some of the stuff that we did with Spike, with where he's wearing this, the the mustache and the, <laughs> and the top hat, and he's being a, an evil guy. <laughs> we had some fun with that. I like I like that moment for sure. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you all very much. But that is all we have time for. Anything else you want to say? That that's that was fast. <laughs> Thanks everybody. I hope it was entertaining for you and informative. I guess I'm going to be here for autographs in like 10 minutes, so I don't have to go anywhere. <laughs>